Well, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Trisha Cruz, Jeff Builder. We'll introduce ourselves again in a little minute. Um, we're very excited to be here. Um, this is a little bit of a, um, I would dare to say, a kickoff meeting for um, us thinking uh, about organizational identifiers and, and uh, really moving this conversation forward and, and uh, producing and implementing something downstream. Um, so <clears throat> what we're going to do today is uh, kind of hopefully set the stage for you all about um, what the future of organizational identifiers are. Um, and then Jeff is going to have a flashback and um, <laughs> he's going to, he's going to uh, uh, share with you um, some of his experience with CNI and hopefully put it in context and, and um, uh, give you an idea of how we can um, move the idea of or organizational identifiers forward. Um, we're going to take a look at the problem statement um, for organizational identifiers and, and um, then look at, at some of what the community initiatives are that are out there. Um, and then think of, uh, a little bit about why uh, particularly Crossref and, and ORCID and DataCite are interested in this space and, and, and why, why we feel we're the people to move this forward. And then look about at why now um, and think about the work that has been done and um, sh um, share with this group about what's next, uh, what, is, what is our path to move forward on our organizational identifiers. Um, and then um, comes the fun part where we're going to look at the requirements themselves that we've, um, that we've talked about, but really at a high level. Um, and then hopefully get some feedback from this group about what our thinking is, whether we're crazy or we're on target or, um, or not. Oh, hi, Lori. <laughs> so um, one of our presenters, Lori, who's right there, um, she, uh, she is, uh, uh, unfortunately, she sprained her ankle and is not able to join us today. Um, but uh, she's online on Jeff's phone and um, she'll be asking questions and listening um, to all of you as, as we move through the presentation. Um, so I am going to hand it over. Oh, Jeff, you. So Jeff and I have not rehearsed this, so um, it's, it's going to be a little bit of, of everything. Uh, right. So, um, uh, well, we, we rehearsed it to the degree that we had to modify the slides in order to divide them amongst two people as opposed to uh, three. Um, but uh, we promised that we'd introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Builder. I'm the uh, Director of Strategic Initiatives for Crossref, which is a DOI registration agency. Um, and uh, Patricia is? I'm the Executive Director of DataCite. Um, and Lori is the director of ORCID. And um, you'll see that little uh, Thor thing over there. Um, and just I want to give you a, a really brief information about what Thor is and, and why it's there um, crowding our, our logos. And um, Thor is a project um, that's funded by the European Commission. It's a 30-month project where we're looking at um, the identifier community and thinking how we can uh, um, integrate those identifiers across our platforms. Um, Crossref is not officially a part of the project, but um, all of our organizations work very, very closely with each other, and um, so we feel like that, that is the best way that we can get uh, a lot of return on our investment. So that's the Thor project in a nutshell. And um, speaking of the sort of um, uh, the fact that we work together very closely, this is the time for the flashback. Um, we work together so closely, in fact, that um, when ORCID was started, um, I was uh, seconded uh, from Crossref to ORCID as their interim CTO at the very beginning when they were just building it, when they were just um, proving it out. And, um, and the flashback is this. The last time I was at CNI uh, was in fact when we were just building out ORCID. We were just prototyping it. We were just coming up with the concepts and one of the things that we did that was very useful at the time was come to CNI to get feedback and to get input from the community, uh, from other stakeholders. You know, Crossref, uh, we have very good connections with, uh, with publishers and some connections with researchers, but not so much the library and archiving community. So it was a, it was a, a tremendously useful exercise uh, at the time. And what you see here was, a, was, was, I think, like three days earlier, we had just managed to get the first ORCID code uh, to boot on a server locally, and it was kind of working, and you can see it had a, an unbelievably but ugly interface and logo and stuff like that. But the good news is that uh, since then, 
uh, ORCID is a fantastic, thriving, and much better designed application. Um, and, uh, and it's really taken off. And it's just gratifying to see this, this you know, latest bit of scholarly uh, you know, identifier infrastructure um, really take hold. Uh, recently, as you've seen, they've passed the two million uh, registered ORCIDs uh, mark, which is a gigantic uh, you know, achievement. Uh, we, you know, just goes way beyond what we at the very early days of ORCID expected uh, as far as uptake and go, and, and so it's really, it's really moving quickly. And, and likewise, I think the other thing that's just um, really taking off is, is, is DataSite. Right, and so um, for those of you that aren't familiar with DataSite, um, we're a nonprofit global organization. Um, we have 30 members worldwide, and uh, those members work with um, nearly 700 data centers. And we, uh, to date, we've uh, minted over 7.4 million DOIs, um, predominantly for data sets, but we also have a lot of text documents, et cetera, um, and over 6 million resolutions a month. So we're kind of the baby in this uh, ORCID and Crossref group. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> She's just um, feeling intimidated by that, I think, which is, right. uh, so we've been around a bit longer. Um, uh, we are also a nonprofit organization, and we assign DOIs primarily, historically, to uh, things like journal articles and proceedings, but also to data sets and books and um, software and all sorts of other content. We've got, uh, just blown by the 80 million uh, registered DOI mark, which is uh, fantastic. Um, and, um, but the, I think the really cool thing about all three of these efforts is that they are so now closely integrated. So, uh, and this was always the vision, you know, from the start, but it's nice to see it start happening. Um, if you're a researcher now and you have an ORCID and you go to one of uh, the publishers who's supporting ORCID at Manuscript Submission, that ORCID will now travel with the metadata and get deposited either to DataCite or to Crossref, depending on what the content is, and then DataCite or Crossref will automatically update the ORCID profile of the researcher. So they don't have to think about this anymore. They don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, I've got to go and collect this information about, you know, my publications because a research assessment program is coming up and I have to go and scramble and find this out. The whole idea behind the establishment of ORCID and the integration of ORCID and DataCite and Crossref was to, like, ultimately save researchers' effort to enable them to not have to worry about collecting this information in their profiles. And this is just coming online and you're just beginning to see ORCID profiles getting updated automatically. And, and so, you know, this we think has been a, a, a you know, a, a victory. Um, the feedback that we're getting from researchers on this functionality is tremendous. Um, but, but clearly we're here, so, uh, and we're talking to you again, and that's indicative of the fact that we um, think that perhaps uh, all is not right, um, that there's still something missing uh, that will really, uh, really sort of um, build on the workflows and make the workflows for tracking research and, um, and assessment exercises a lot more efficient. Um, and, but we still have a problem. And the problem as we see it, and we sort of debated about how to, you know, uh, talk about this, is that we've got this, we've got this stool. Right, and if you notice, it's kind of missing a bit, um, or possibly missing a bit, and that's one of the things that we're, that we're trying to explore. Uh, we certainly have two legs of the stool, which are really important, right? We have content identifiers uh, that DataCite and Crossref are providing, and now we have contributor identifiers that ORCID is providing. And this alone sort of enables a ton of functionality. It means that an institution that knows the ORCIDs of its researchers can look in the data site or Crossref metadata to see when new content comes out with that ORCID attached to it. And if it's, it comes out, they can uh, download it and archive it and do all sorts of other things. It means that funders uh, who know that they've given a grant to somebody with a particular ORCID can go in and see the research outputs that are being delivered uh, from, that, from that funding tranche. And these are all you know, hugely useful things. But there's, a, there's something that would really truly make this whole stool stand up and, and, and really function, and that's organization identifiers. Um, you know, to be able to have an institution say, I want to be able to reliably 
determine that, you know, what publications have come out with people affiliated with my institution so that I can track them for, for you know, this would just enable a whole host of new applications and enable, we think, the entire community, publishers, institutions, funders, um, uh, researchers, to, to automate a lot of otherwise tedious workflow. And the question we have here is this. There are a lot of players in this space at the moment of one form or another. But I'm going to ask you a question. How many people in here think the organization identifier uh, issue is, is a solved issue in the, to the degree that content identifiers and ORCID identifiers are? Anybody think this is? My guess is that if you thought it was, you wouldn't be here. So it's a pretty easy, it was a pretty easy guess to make. So yeah, so this is the problem, right? We kind of have a, maybe a, a wobbly leg, not quite the, 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 thir the, the third leg of the stool that we need. Um, and, and I don't think we're the only ones that think so. There have been a number of studies. We've commissioned um, internal studies ourselves, but also some public ones, notably a just Casre. Um, study that just talked about what a nightmare um, organizational identifiers are. Um, our own uh, Martin Fenner has added to this um, occasionally. Um, and I can just say that, you know, uh, talking to the community, this is always a thing. It's like, when are we going to get this? Um, I know that uh, Cliff, uh, sitting in the back, I've talked to him in the past about organizational identifiers and what a horrible, gnarly, and difficult problem it could be. Um, but yet here we are. Um, you know, there's a documented need for these things, um, and um, and 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 here are some critical aspects of it. Right, just like the identifiers that exist for content and for contributors, we want these systems to be comprehensive, open, and accessible. Right, these are sort of some ground rules for identifiers that are going to be fundamental to the infrastructure of scholarly communication. Right, and, and I think, Jeff, one thing to note about this is the organizational identifier infrastructure doesn't only imply the technology. Right. It implies the organization as well that supports that technology the, and, and this the is, community. And this is something that we'll, we'll probably harp on to your, uh, until you're sick of it. But um, now, there, as we've noted, there's a lot of excellent work. You know, there are people in this space, but there's this gap. Um, and, and it's a gap that has just affected each of our organizations a lot. It's something that's constantly tripping us up. And, um, and so the big question you might be asking is why are we doing this? And, um, and I think there are a few reasons, um, but we all need them. Um, and we need them, in a, it, it, we need them in so many different use cases and so many different roles. And one of the complications I think that we have and one of the reasons we're going out to the community is to figure out which use cases and which particular areas we want to focus on. Because I think that the organizational identifier problem has a lot of characteristics that we experience with the um, researcher uh, uh, you know, or the contributor ID problem, which is that when we started out and we talked about contributor IDs, everybody had an idea about why they were important and all of those ideas focused on different kinds of use cases. So you had one group of people who was focusing on things having to do with authentication and authorization, and you had another group of people who was focusing on issues around, involved uh, around, um, around discovery um, and things like that. And the two use and those use cases, some of, the, some of them were really complicated and some of them were easier to deal with. And so one of the big things we had to do at the beginning of the ORCID process was determining which of those problems were tractable, which ones were reasonable for us to try and deal with, um, and which ones would we either ignore or postpone. Um, and that was one of the biggest, you know, making those decisions was one of the things that got us the most momentum in, um, in, uh, in ORCID. But we have experience with, um, we, we need these, we have experience in the identifier space. Uh, each of us, I think, represents a broad community of stakeholders, um, and, uh, and clearly each of these communities has different use cases, and we have to understand the, 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 the full gamut of them. And, um, and this is the critical thing. Um, at the moment, we're willing to take it on. I mean, we've just sat here and dithered about this for quite a long time. 
Um, and, um, and I know, and I'll, I'll talk about this later, you know, when we were working on ORCID, people would come up to us and say, why aren't you tackling the organizational identifier problem too? And we're like, holy, you know what I mean? We're trying to deal with one big thing. Um, it's way too complicated for us to do that. And besides, we thought at the time that there were other entities who looked like they were gonna tackle it and maybe solve the problem. But um, right. that- Right, I think yes, one, one thing to really note is, um, why, why we think that, that we're poised to work on this is that Crossref, um, DataCite, and ORCID, saying that we all represent different communities and we work, um, we work globally, and scholarship is global. And I think Crossref um, works with publishers. We work with a lot of national libraries and, and data centers and, and ORCID working directly with researchers. You bring that whole package together, we really have a good idea about that broad stakeholder community. So. Um, I think that's really important to know. Yeah, and I'll, I'll build on that. And we talk a little bit about it later as well. But you know, um, one of the one of the anti patterns that we uh, keep trying to you know sort of get beyond is the idea that scholarly infrastructure is country focused or institution focused or um, or discipline focused, right? Um, you know, increasingly research is international. It uh, always transcends institutions. Almost everybody is collaborating with people outside of their institution. Um, and, um, and so any kind of infrastructure that we build has to accommodate that. It can't be an infrastructure for physicists in the U.S. Um, it, and, and, and all of our organizations have really taken that to heart. We built systems that we want to work globally uh, across disciplines. Um, and, and across institutions. Um, which brings us to why now, um, well, we, the, the community really is, uh, keeps coming to us and saying you gotta do something. Um, we think we have a good understanding of the requirements. Um, and again, I think that this depends on the use cases. There are some requirements <coughs> where we're quite fuzzy, but there are others um, where I think we have a very, a, a much better sense so for instance, just so that I don't sound like I'm being coy, um, just as with ORCID, you might have authentication issues and discovery issues, you have something similar with organizational identifiers, right? You could have a authentication focused view of organizational identifiers, or you could have a discovery uh, focused view of organizational identifiers. And as I'll illustrate later on, those two don't necessarily match. You know, you're still use, you're using identifiers. You're talking about organizations, but there there can be some disconnects there, and those are some of the things um, uh, that we want to explore. Do you have any? No. Okay. So, um, what's been done uh, so far? Uh, we three, besides getting together and saying we've got to do something, um, we've been we've been doing a lot of sort of background research, looking at past reports um, that have analyzed the identifier structure, trying to itemize. Uh, the use cases and requirements from those um, and build some of these things. Uh, we're going to point you uh, a little later on to some to a document that where we've been collecting some of these things and where we're going to encourage you to um, add observations and things like that. Um, and we've developed a long list of requirements. And again, I'm going to emphasize that it's a long list, right? Because part of the reason I think that a lot of people have been reluctant to tackle this is that they get that long list of requirements and they think, well, if we don't solve them all, we can't do it. And we actually, at the moment, think that there are probably parts that can be carved off and done sooner, and then other bits that may need to be postponed, and other bits that really are so gnarly that um, maybe they're things that we don't want to even touch. Um, and this brings us to what next. Uh, we want to expand the, the list of use cases. And again, this is why we're coming to you. Um, and, and then we want to go and prioritize the requirements. What do we think we can do? What do we think is a tractable problem in the shorter term? Um, and, um, and then, and, and, and this is the process that we're through. This is the first of at least two meetings that we have scheduled now um, to talk about, um, about, about the issue with the community. Uh, the next one is actually going to be a workshop at uh, Force 2016 um, in Portland. Um, and if anybody's going to be at that, we encourage you to be there. It's going to, we're really going to try and hash through some of the things that we gather here and um, that we gather between now and then. Um, and then we're going to create some, um, you know, some groups to explore some of the particular issues uh, that we identify within that. And, um, and we're really, you know, hoping that we have 
a, a pretty clear direction of where we want to go uh, in the fall. And um, again, you know, based on our experience setting up other things like ORCID and stuff like that, this seems like a um, a reasonable uh, a reasonable uh, uh, schedule to us. But we'll see. You know, we'll see what kind of feedback we get. Uh, what's happening today? Well, we want to. Uh, we would, we'd like to point you at this list of requirements that we put uh, together up here. Uh, we'll make these slides available, but if you can get down th this, this uh, uh, um, shortened URL, uh, you can see uh, the list as we have it at the moment. Uh, we'd love to uh, discuss some of the issues that we've come up with um, and, um, and get your feedback on that and then also incorporate that into the document. Yeah, and, and part of that is also um, supplying your use cases of, and, um, and uh, sharing with us some of those things so we can make sure that our requirements are on the right track with that. Yeah. And which brings us to this. Yep. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to break down the requirements into uh, requirements that we consider to be primarily organizational and those that are uh, more technical. And uh, again, Patricia alluded to this at the very beginning. One of the things that concerns us all in this space is um, if we are planning on building infrastructure, we think that that infrastructure has to be governed and has to be um, organized in a way, you know, it's not just about technology. It's about an organization that keeps running this technology that's sustainable, that's accountable, um, and that people are ultimately going to trust. And this is a, a, a very big issue. Um, trust is, you know, we, we, we have this sort of reflexive um, and, and understandable worry whenever we see a big chunk of critical infrastructure get centralized um, because uh, clearly that could be a single point of failure. Uh, it could, we've had experiences of organizations that have, you know, started out as community organizations and then have sort of uh, parted ways with the community and gone their own way and become unaccountable and un unreachable and, 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 and ungovernable. So a lot of people have some, some, you know, very big concerns about what an organization, uh, you know, that's going to be responsible for so much infrastructure is going to look like. And this, again, is something that we encountered in the very, very early days of working. Um, and one of, the f one of the first things we did, and I, 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 you know, seriously was the first thing the board did, is they had to adopt some principles that governed the operation of the ORCID board and the ORCID organization. And this was the first thing they did when the board was formed, was pass these, um, these principles. And we have at least, I think, one uh, ex-ORCID board member in the audience back there. I saw Craig come in. Uh, so he remembers this. This was a really, um, you know, important point in ORCID's history because once we adopted these ten principles, which committed the organization to be sort of open and transparent and that the data was going to be open and that the business models were not going to be based on enclosing the data, that had a profound effect on how people perceive the organization, whether or not they were likely to trust it with, with such vital institutional, you know, or uh, infrastructural uh, role. And so um, uh, I, uh, since the drafting of those principles, I've been working with some other colleagues um, who you may know, Cameron Nalen and Jennifer Lynn, um, and we've been spending a lot of time talking about what the characteristics need to be and these are aspirational. I have to, I will add very quickly that I don't think ORCID meets them yet. I don't think DataCite meets them yet. I don't think Crossref meets them yet. But we've come up with a set of aspirational um, sort of um, uh, uh, description of what, a, what needs to happen with an organization for it to be a trusted, um, a trustworthy, sorry, um, uh, infrastructure in scholarly communication. And those, those, those things that we talk about cover things like coverage. Like, for instance, I mentioned that, you know, infrastructure ideally transcends disciplines, nations, um, uh, institutions, and things like that. Uh, governance, uh, that is, who is the organization open to? How is it actually operated? Um, is it, you know, for-profit, not-for-profit? Um, which gets us to sustainability, because clearly if we're running infrastructure, uh, it would be very irritating um, if uh, that infrastructure disappeared on grant cycles. I mean, imagine if uh, lights and plumbing 
uh, were funded on a grant cycle, and every time you ran out of money, your lights went out. Um, that would be a pretty frustrating infrastructure to deal with. So we're very concerned about uh, sustainability. And lastly, we're like we, we talk an awful lot about the insurance. That is, how you know, if all else goes wrong, how can you still feel some uh, know that you're going to be able to at least extract yourself from the system? Um, and so there are all sorts of governance issues, and we don't want to go into them in huge detail there. But if you want to see the kinds of stuff we're talking about and thinking about, there's this article that that we that we wrote, which was grounded very much on our experience in you know running things like uh, uh, Crossref and, and founding Orchid and, and data site and um, and and I think it it's uh, really you know it's 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 pretty important in our conception of any solution to this problem of organizational identifiers as well and this brings us to the technical thing which is what most people focus on immediately when they're thinking about infrastructure and um, and as I sort of alluded to earlier, you know, when we were dealing with ORCID in the early days, we had a lot of people come up uh, to us and say, um, but aren't organizational identifiers easier than identifiers for people? And, uh, you know, I've got cue laughter, right? <laughs> because anybody who thinks about it for three seconds realizes that, you know, organizations have all sorts of irritating habits, like they do things like merge and split and have aliases and die and are reborn and, and you know, uh, people identifiers. That's that's difficult. But I don't know of any person who has sub people, um, <laughs> and I don't, and I haven't seen a reborn uh, you know uh, uh, person yet. And, and so, I mean, the problems really associated with we're, you know, what I'm trying to establish is we're not naive about this, right? We know that this is a big, bigger problem. That it has some uh, complications that are that are quite different. Uh, to the ones having to do with um, uh, contributor IDs. And this gets us to perspective. You know, um, the rose tinted uh, glasses view of organizational identifiers is this should be easy, right? Harvard University. Clearly, this is, uh, you know, something that nobody is going to doubt. Everybody has the same view this is Harvard University. But of course, you know, that depends. Are you looking at it from the point of view with subscription glasses on, right? where you might actually be talking about your, um, your relationship with a library at Harvard. Um, or even more specifically, um, you know, IP ranges um, for subscriptions, right? Um, and uh, if you're looking at it with, you know, membership glasses on, yeah, it might be Harvard University. But go off and look up Harvard University as a legal entity, you know, and it's presidents and fellows of Harvard College. Now, imagine for a second that you're trying to populate a list that was, that was you know, designed to allow a researcher to pick their affiliation, and you put that up, right? That wouldn't work too well. So it's really important for us to figure out, you know, which of these, or, you know, which of these sort of perspectives um, we want. And then affiliation might be something as far more precise. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the things that we're exploring here is that all of those perspectives, all of those different views of what an organization are, are clearly all important. And, um, and, and some of them are just unbelievable rat's nests, and some of them are probably a little easier to do. But even doing the easier ones might make the rat's nest ones uh, easier to do in the longer term. And I know, again, you know, this is um, because I've, I've had, you know, brief conversations with Cliff um, about this in the past, and particularly talking about things like, um, you know, subscriptions and IP ranges and so on and so forth. We know this is a big issue, right? But we also know that this is a horribly messy issue. And so one of the things we're trying to decide as we look at all these use cases is which things can we pick off and do more easily, and which ones are harder. And maybe things, that maybe there are harder things that we don't want to touch but that we want to at least enable somebody else to do it more easily, right? So you can make an argument that even if we attached, decided to focus our energy on, you know, organizations from an affiliation point of view, right, that that might ultimately make 
um, somebody's life easier if they were trying to account for organizations from a subscription point of view. Um, and again, this is, this is all the kind of stuff that we're sort of churning through, trying to understand, trying to get a picture of. Um, but I'll say up front that I think a lot of the driver for all of us focusing on, on this issue now has a lot to do with affiliations, right. right? And in turn, the driver for that is a changing environment in research where it is becoming increasingly important for funders, for institutions, for researchers to keep track of all of their research outputs in a comprehensive way, a systemic way. Um, and that this is occurring at an industrial scale now. Whereas before, you might have had to put together a list of your publications when you were up for promotion or tenure. Now you have to do it every X years. And it has to be complete. And it has to be, you know, and everybody, not just everybody in this institution has to do it, but everybody in every institution in a country has to do it at the same time. And so the old mechanisms whereby you could just write a note to somebody and say, could you, you know, send me an acceptance, you know, a letter confirming that you've accepted my paper and such and such, those don't scale anymore uh, for this kind of uh, uh, stuff. And we know that institutions are struggling trying to keep track of this information and they have to keep track of it. We know that funders are struggling to do this and we know that publishers um, want to be able to make it easier for their researchers um, to provide this information. And so uh, at the moment, the, you know, one of the sweet spots that we're looking at that where we think we could provide um, you know, a great deal of value um, for a subset of the organizational identifier um, uh, problem, overall problem, is, uh, is affiliations. But again, that's a working hypothesis, and that's why we're here, and that's why we're talking to people, is to know whether we can usefully hive that part off and focus on it in any way, um, in, in, in a way that makes sense and that's useful uh, in the short term. So, you know, again, um, I think the, the, one of the big messages we want to get across is that this is a group effort. Um, we all have skin in this game. We all need to solve the problem. And um, so we're collaborating in a way that's even more sort of, um, you know, uh, more intensive than we have even in the past because we think that this is a big enough problem that it's gonna take all of our efforts to really solve it and to reach all the communities that matter. Um, and, um, and, um, and, and we're at that stage that I was at when I came to CNI the last time talking about ORCID where we're trying to get um, more community input so that we're pretty sure that we understand the problem and so that we can move forward. So again, I think there are two um, places uh, where you can provide immediate feedback. One is if anybody's going to be involved in 416, uh, we encourage you to come to this session uh, where we're going to be talking about a lot of the stuff we think in a lot more detail. Um, and then also look at this draft that we've put together, uh, which is a sort of a, as we say, it's a long list. It's a mix of things. It's, you know, it's, we've, we, you know, we, we struggled with should we release this now or and we, we, uh, or should we fix it up and make it lovely and organized and neat? We decided to you know, get it out there as early as possible so that we can start getting feedback and we'll, um, and we'll neaten it up and organize it as, as we go. Um, and then lastly, of course, uh, you can get in touch with any of us if you have um, ideas about this or if you want to talk about particular use cases that you think are being ignored or not you know, uh, being talked about, um, you can address all of us. Um, immediately. And then lastly, um, because, um, and I know that, uh, I hope, um, I hope uh, Lori's still there. You still? She's still there. <laughs> She's still there. Um, uh, Lori was concerned that we might not leave room for uh, us to get feedback. And so I'm happy to say that we've actually uh, got uh, quite a bit of time for us to get people to, you know, to, to get people's feedback on what kinds of issues they'd like to see and, you know, and to test our ideas about affiliation data versus subscription data and things like that. So I think, yes, the, the floor is open. Thanks, Thanks a lot, everybody. everyone.